it's been an extraordinary opportunity for me to be down here these past two years. I was at the NIH for a while and the FDA. You know, I, I really sort of groomed my skills in, in drug development, being able to write protocols, learning drug development, performing drug development, and, and of course, learning all the regulations. And here now, I have the ability to really put that in, in, in full force. And, and so we are, you know, we, as you probably know, we, we were granted the Myeloma Institute status uh, about a month ago. Um, we have our own division, and that gives us really the flexibility to, to move forward, like, at 100 miles an hour, so to speak, in, in developing drugs. Um, my main focus here is really to um, kind of um, foster and, and grow the, especially investigator-sponsored trial enterprise, and, and we work really closely with, with our um, colleagues that, that focus on the underlying biology and the translational work. And so we're really all translational and we're all really physicians at heart. And we, we see each other all the time and kind of have the same goals. And so, um, you know, one of my main focuses has been on, on um, the immunotherapies, especially like the bispecific therapies, et cetera. We are, um, you know, any, any month now, we will be opening um, a bispecific trial, specifically in myeloma precursor disease. Um, again, we definitely have a lot of strength and a lot of expertise in, in you know, the precursor diseases, which, which as you know, are smoldering myeloma and, and, and MGUS. And a lot of the work that we're doing are kind of the second or third reiterations of what we've done, you know, what I've done at NIH and when I've left and, and doctor, you know, and the other, including Dr. Langren at NIH and, and, and Memorial Sloan Kettering. And so, so we're able to continue, um, you know, that uh, programmatically. And we are really, we are really developing and, and opening newer, newer um, novel therapies that, um, you know, don't make make even bispecifics look look old. So, so it's like really exciting, and, and I'm very happy to be here. And and I think you know, there's, there's so many patients in need here, quite honestly. And, and our program is, has has doubled in in like no time, and all of our clinics are are being double booked already. So, um, so we have we have a lot of. Uh, you know, the, how do they say the future looks really good? So one of the things that makes treating myeloma a little bit difficult, difficult or, or, or challenging is that not all myeloma is myeloma. And, and it's, it's almost very similar to lymphoma, except in, in lymphoma, biologically, it's more simple, and, and scientists have been able to dissect it. And, you know, as you know, in the WHO, there's like 60-plus different types of lymphoma. But there's really only one type of myeloma, and, and that's that we, that we understand that we treat but reality, there's, there's much more. And as, as we get towards that precision medicine efforts and, and we understand things, one of the important things that we've seen is certain types of myeloma may have gone into arrest, meaning may have mutated or altered in a stage that's in between what would be lymphoma cells and myeloma cells. And they, these kind of cells tend to express some more B cell markers compared to plasma cell markers. And one of those is, is BCL2, for example. So BCL2 is a protein. It's really important in, in the apoptotic pathway. It's really this, um, the apoptotic pathway in a cell is kind of like that cyanide pill that, that's inherently built in, into, or, into um, organisms. And it's a tug of war. You have good cells that promote um, the cell living, and you have bad, it depends on how you look at it, but, but bad proteins that, that promote it to die, um, and one of the ways cancer works is by affecting, you know, that sort of balance between the good and the bad proteins, such that it helps the myeloma, the myeloma cells, the cancerous cells, manipulate that so that so that the side that promotes cell living wins. And one of those is is the BCL2 protein. And so, if you have too much BCL2 protein, then you're Less likely to under the cell is less likely to undergo apoptosis, which is basically cell death. And one of the things that you know has been developed um, in hematologic cancers in general are BCL2 inhibitors. So these are small molecules as opposed to antibody-based therapies that target BCL2 and, and, and prevent its function. And like I, I was alluding to, in, in certain types of myeloma. We have too much BCL2 inhibitors, excuse me, BCL2 protein, which does drive the multiple myeloma, at least somewhat. And what we've seen is 
by inhibiting uh, BCL2, that could actually lead to myeloma cell death. And, you know, with a direct sort of um, translation into, you know, patients' tumors regressing. Um, exactly. We are still sort of amidst un in under uh, uncovering all the intricate pathways and stuff that have to do with that BCL2. But one thing we know, and we don't completely understand why, is that that high BCL2 is associated with a particular translocation in multiple myeloma called 1114. And so that's why a lot of the more recent studies um, that are evaluating 1114 specifically with the use of what we call BCL2 inhibitors. There's been some older ones like Nevitoclax, which quickly was followed by Venetoclax, and now there's second generation BCL2 inhibitors. So here in Miami, we have um, two industry sponsored trials that are using, sort of speak, these second generation BCL2 inhibitors, um, which are, are really showing promise. And I'd like to highlight our third trial is actually an investigator sponsored trial that, that I, um, I wrote and I am the principal investigator for that is, that is open for screening if anyone's interested. But basically, the point of this is that um, it's for patients who have the 1114 translocation, we feel that a drug called Selenexor may actually help um, inhibit some of the bypass pathways to resistance with venetoclax alone. So basically, we feel like the combination of venetoclax and Selenexor together may be exponentially beneficial as 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 opposed to just um, you know additively, um, how do we? Th why do we think that? Well, we've seen these. We've shown it preclinically in the lab at U University of Miami. We've also have had cases, you know, anecdotal end of two cases with patients where this was attempted, and, and patients did derive what we thought was was direct clinical benefit. Because, for example, both of these two of patients, for example, were already on venetoclax, and that the drug was failing them. And so when Selenexor was added, they actually retained it, regained their response. So I think there is some both preclinical and clinical rationale, which led us to this phase two um, single arm study, which is, which is open. So we will officially test the hypothesis.